and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Good morning, you guys. My name is Kaylee, and this is my sister, Jordan. And today we're going to read you some scripture from Isaiah 9. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Nap Naphtali. Sorry. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it, with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Isaiah 9, 67. Good morning, church family and friends and guests with us. My name is Brandon Ziske, the lead pastor here at Austin Oaks Church, where our heartbeat is to be simply all about Jesus. So glad to have you. I love Acorns to Oaks. My kiddo was part of that program, and it's so fun to see you all here. So it is such an honor to do this with you. Thank you for blessing us. And so you are free with mom and dad's permission to roll around on the floor. Totally good. Um, this, isn't this the ugliest thing you've ever seen in your life? But let's be clear, not me, this. And if you are a cat lover, one, why? But two, um, we, this will be for auction later. So proceeds will go to good things, like a dog shirt. Um, <laughs> I love Christmas. One of the things that I love about Christmas is reflecting on the memories. And one of my favorite memories as a kid at Christmas within the Ziski household was when my dad and I would get ready to put up the Christmas lights. Loved it. It was just something that my dad and I would do. And every year, my dad would always try to outdo the previous year. And, you know, like you would pull down the boxes from the attic or whatever storage it is. And it always feels like, like the Christmas light troll showed up because, you know, you wrapped them up so nice and neat the year before. And they worked the year before. But somewhere in those 11 months, that troll got in there and started to mess with those lights. And they don't work. All those types of things. But, like, you can't think about Christmas without Christmas lights. Christmas lights really like are, are part of what we do to spread the cheer, to get people into the spirit of the season. And I'm a Minnesota boy, so I moved here four years ago from Minnesota to Texas. And, and like, I was astonished as to how early Texans get Christmas lights up. Okay, it's like the reverse for us in Minnesota. We don't take them down to March, but that's because of weather. But you guys put up lights well before Thanksgiving. It's like this sense of anticipation to get ourselves ready for the spirit of the season, which is, if you think about it, a fascinating phrase. Like, what do we even mean when we say that? But nonetheless, Christmas is a season that ought to remind us of the true light that came into this world. And one of my favorite passages that I love to go back to in Christmas is out of John chapter 1, specifically verse 4 and 5. It says, In him was life. In the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It's hard to imagine Christmas without Christmas lights. Yeah. And it's hard to not think of Clark Griswold when it comes to Christmas lights. Now, we don't have an elf movie clip. We have a different movie clip this morning. So please watch and enjoy. Twenty five thousand incandescent lights. Love it. 
sings joy to the world, the horrible drum roll, only to find it not work, to finally get it to work, to find it like drained of power, all to get it in the spirit of the season. So I had a moment of procrastination this week, and I decided, hey, I'm curious to know about the history of Christmas lights and why we even started this tradition in the first place. And it was rather fascinating, and um, I started to discover that the first time that lights, Christmas lights, got put on a tree was in like 1660. It started in Germany, and it's actually kind of a shock if you think about it. They put candles on cut pine trees. I love to burn the pine tree when Christmas is over. Like, that's a safety hazard, right? But they didn't do it to, like, think about the light. They actually did it to show off the ornaments because there wasn't electricity. So if you fast forward when technology advanced, Thomas Edison in 1879, he created the first string lights. And he did it for two reasons. The first reason was to spread cheer, to help people get into the spirit of the season. And the second reason wasn't so innocent and nice. It was to actually to win the contract for the city of Manhattan so they would hire him for his lights. And then the commercialization of Christmas lights picked up and GE jumped on it and other companies jumped in from GE to Noma Christmas lights. That brings me all the way back to my favorite childhood memory from my grandpa and grandma's house, the bubble lights. Anybody know the bubble lights? Come on, bring them back. Hipsters, where are you? I'm just saying, got to bring them back. They're amazing. But like, what's, like, like what caught my heart and my mind on this was like over the years as like technology progressed, we have literally created every kind of light you can imagine to spread the Christmas cheer to simply help people get into the spirit of the season. Which is what? Hope, joy, peace. Now, the direction I'm going to head makes, may, make me sound like a Scrooge, but I promise you I'm not. Because all of these lights, like all of these lights, Christmas lights, they're just artificial. They're fake. They're not the true light. Like they have to borrow a power source from something outside of itself. And they've got a short lifespan, right? Things can happen to it. Things on the outside can happen. Like, for instance, like, you know, you miss one of these bulbs. This is so frustrating. And the whole string goes out, right? The bulbs could burn out. They could have shorts, all these kind of things. And maybe you even have a power outage too soon. So many things from the outside can affect the, the finite nature of these artificial lights. The reality is, all of these manufactured lights are a shadow of the real thing. They will eventually die out. The darkness will always overcome artificial light. Always. And I was thinking about that. I was like, you know what? All of these Christmas lights, these artificial lights to help us get into the spirit of the season actually really reminds me of what humanity does. The pursuit of light, to try to get us to find hope and joy and peace, security, the things that our heart and our souls deeply long for. So we pursue and create all sorts of things that reflect light, that give these promises, but truth be told, they're just empty promises. The fruit of humanity's pursuit in these artificial life is so true. It is so apparent and it's so clear that the only thing that the artificial light can truly offer humanity are empty promises. Yes, they may momentarily scratch the itch, and yes, you may finally get into those greener pastures that you've been longing for, and yes, you might reach that financial peace, and yes, you may finally get that relationship and all those types of things, but it won't last. The itch will get worse because our souls and our desires know one word, and it's the word more more. And if we put our hope in anything else besides the true light, in artificial light, the darkness will always overcome it. But Christmas, Christmas tells us, it it declares to us year after year after year, as if God is by means of showing, like, I love you, I need you to hear this and to understand this, that Christmas reminds us that there's a darkness that the light, there's a light that the darkness cannot touch. There's a light that the darkness cannot overcome, and his name is Emmanuel. It's Jesus. So what I want to do this morning is I want to talk to you 
about how the Bible describes this very pattern of humanity. I want you to see this morning how Christmas, the birth of Christ, Jesus, is truly the only solution, the only remedy to the desires in our hearts that make us chase after artificial light and how Jesus came to be that true light. So if you have a Bible with you or a phone, I want to encourage you to turn with me. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 7 and 8 and 9. But if you don't, it's okay. We'll have the verses on the screen behind me. Now, Isaiah 9, the verses that we just heard are some of the most wide, widely read and spoken scriptures in Christmas. For to us, a son is born, to us a child is given, and his name will be Wonderful Counselor. Like, we rehearse that, but we fail to oftentimes remember the backdrop of this promise. And that's what I want to get into is for us to understand what happens when humanity, when you and I in our individual lives and collectively as a society pursue artificial life where we run after these things that these world offers and these false and empty promises, what will happen? So in Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 2, what we see here in these two verses, it's a snapshot of history, and it's really telling what happens to every single one of us when the darkness shows up on our doorstep. In the days of Ahaz, the king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the king of Israel, they came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it. So Syria and Israel is coming to attack Judah, to attack the king Ahaz. But they couldn't mount an attack against it. So when the house of David, when Ahaz heard of the news, and when Judah heard the news that Syria is in league with Ephraim, that Syria made an alliance with Israel to come attack them, the heart of Ahaz, the heart of the leader was shaken and full of anxiety and dread. And the heart of the people were shaking as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. What we need to see here is the fruit of believing the promises that are offered by artificial light. Assyria is the emerging nation. It's the big kid on the block now. And they're, they're just hungering after more power, more land, and more influence. And so they have come now to attack Syria, Israel, and even Judah. So the king of Syria and the king of Israel hear this. They see Assyria coming. The darkness is coming on their doorstep. They're like, we got to come together so that way we can have a fighting chance. And so they went, but we probably aren't sufficient. We need Judah. But they know that Ahaz won't join them because Ahaz has other ambitions. And so like, we need to attack Jerusalem. We need to attack Judah, take Ahaz out, and set up our own puppet king. Ahaz hears of this plan. He knows that Assyria is coming, and he knows that Syria and Israel are also plotting to come against him. And he's freaking out. He's about to lose his prominence, his authority, his blessing that he thought he had, his security, the things that he put his joy and peace in. All of these things are now significantly rattled, all because of an external circumstance is upon them. Ahaz was a horrible king. He led the nation of Israel to worship all sorts of gods, artificial lights. He did what was right in his own eyes. He didn't want to trust God. He didn't want to believe in the promises of God. He even shut the doors of the temple, which the presence of God was promised to be there, which was to be the light, not just of the nation, but for the whole world. When darkness came on his doorstep, the artificial light that he put his hope in revealed itself. And it revealed itself through his anxiety and his fear and his dread. What will happen now because of this? This is the proof that he was putting his hope and trust in an artificial life. Have you ever been there? <laughs> Good. This brought me back to a small stint when I was a banker. I was a banker in 07, 08, when the financial crisis happens. And some of you remember that, right? In 2007, in the 8, in that period when the housing market collapsed, 
foreclosures were on the rise and stocks were plummeting. So many people would come asking me questions, what's going to happen to their retirement? What's going to happen to their finances? And there was so much dread, so much fear, so much anxiety. Did you feel that? Do you remember those days? That's the fruit of the empty promises that artificial light gives you. It was so bad that there was news stations and articles reporting of people jumping out of buildings, committing suicide because they lost their finances. That's an artificial life. If I have finances and I have wealth, I'm good. That will buy me the peace and the security that I need. But the end result is darkness. Darkness always overcomes the artificial light. Always. So God in his grace and his love for people since Isaiah, a messenger of God, he comes to Ahaz and he says, listen, don't listen to them. Don't fear what's going to happen. Don't go there. It won't happen. Trust me. Return again to the true light. Be quiet in your soul. Don't run after it. Don't react to it. Turn away from the thought that you have, that you think that coming up with a treaty with Assyria will be the hope in this situation. Don't do it, Ahaz. I got this. Return to me. And in verse 7, you see God pleading with Ahaz. It won't happen. It shall not come to pass. And if you aren't firm in your faith, if you don't come to the true light and you don't believe in me again, listen, you won't stand firm at all, which means your life will reflect one of anxiety and insecurity and wandering and disillusionment. And he goes to Ahaz and he's like, listen, Ahaz, I know you don't trust me. I know you struggle with this and I know you haven't. God's grace, he says, ask me for a sign. It could be as deep as the pit of hell or as high as the heavens, ask me. And Ahaz, wrapped up in false piety, says, no, I'm not going to ask the Lord. I'm not going to put him to test. He's lying. That's the, he's not trying to be holy. He doesn't want to hear it, because he knows if he hears it, then he's going to have to be held accountable to it. But not only that, he doesn't want to let go of controlling what he thinks will satisfy him, what he thinks would be the solution to the situation. He doesn't want to change his ways. God goes, fine, Ahaz, I'm going to give you the sign anyways because this sign and the situation is far greater than just you, Ahaz. It's actually for the whole world. It's for all humanity, for all time. Verse 14, here's the sign. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she'll call his name Emmanuel. Think about that for a moment. Let's just say right now in your life, some form of darkness, some form of an external threat is coming upon your doorstep and threatening maybe to radically change your finances, maybe your relationships, maybe your job or your health, whatever it is. And you're full of anxiety and worry and dread. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to go. And you're starting to scheme in your heart and your mind. Go, okay, if this happens, now what? And so you start to think about solutions, how to remedy that or how to fix that or how to safeguard that. And then you may even turn to God and here's the solution that God gives you. Oh, I promise you a baby. Now put yourself in Ahaz's shoes with Assyria coming that wants to take these nations out and two other kingdoms plotting against you. And you go, hey God, well, how, what's going on here? What to do? And all this kind of stuff. And you feel all anxiety and God finally brings the messenger. He goes, here's the solution. I'm going to give you a baby. Thanks. You know, it takes a while for that nine months, and a baby can't really do much, not for a while. God, so that's a horrible plan, God. My solution's better. I know how to best protect my heart, my desires to bring peace again. I'm going to go ahead and decide to make that treaty with Assyria. I know what's best for me. 
I know what will bring me peace. I know what will bring me joy. And God, it's not in your ridiculous promise of a baby. It's not in your promise of a virgin giving birth. Virgins don't give birth. That's ridiculous, God. The Bible, the Bible is old. It's just made up and full of contradictions. It's ridiculous. It's archaic. No, I'll do my own thing. He missed it. He missed the promise wrapped up in the name Emmanuel. God with us. God with us. This is the hope. This is the true light that is wrapped up in this name of God. He's with us now and forever. Ahaz, if you would understand this, if you would get this, yes, it will come. But I also told you to not worry about this. My purpose will happen. It will accomplish exactly what I want to do. Because listen, if I am for you, nothing can be against you. If God is for us, then nothing could ever separate you from the love and the faithfulness of God. This is the light that the darkness can cannot touch. This is God giving Ahaz and the nation of Israel. This is God giving humanity an option to choose which light to trust in. You can continue to trust in your artificial light or you can finally trust in the true light. But humanity's propensity, our propensity, if we were honest with ourselves, because we're broken and because we're sinful and because of the pride of our heart that always thinks we know what's right, our propensity is to always choose the artificial light, to always choose the instant gratification, to always choose what we think will get us to those greener pastures. And God says, listen, Ahaz, this is what's going to happen if you do. Why didn't he believe God? Why do we deny him? Why do we run away from him? Why do we choose to not listen? Why do we choose to laugh at the promise of a baby? John 3, verse 19, out of the mouth of Jesus himself, he just makes it clear. He's like, and this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works or their desires and their heart were evil. They didn't want to surrender. They didn't want to stop being God. They didn't want to fully trust that maybe God was right. They were nervous, scared, whatever it was. It's sin. God warns and tells Ahaz, I'm going to deal with Syria. I'm going to deal with Israel. Oh, and um, by the way, Ahaz... The treaty you think you're making with Assyria that's going to keep you safe and keep you in your position. He says in verse 6 and 7, he goes, Because the people, because you, Ahaz, and the people refuse the waters of Shiloh, which is a symbolic picture of Emmanuel, because you have chosen to refuse the promise, to choose to come to the true light. It flows gently. Love that picture. Verse 7, he says, Assyria's going to come, and they're going to betray the treaty, and they're going to take you out. God then encourages Isaiah. Isaiah's a man who put his trust in the promise, put his trust in the true light, put his trust in the voice of God. And he's telling him, he's like, listen, don't walk in the way of this people. They're choosing the artificial life. They're rejecting this promise and they're full of anxiety. They're full of dread. They're chasing this. They're propping up this and it's going to sound good. It's going to sound tempting. Don't walk in the way of this people. You're with these people. You're in the world, but don't walk in that way. Don't trust in the artificial lights that they are saying you need to do. Don't call conspiracy what they call conspiracy. That's a little fascinating for today, isn't it? Don't do it. Don't get caught up with all of the pundits and social media heads. Don't get caught up with all the news anchors and all the things where they're projecting and forecasting future events and spinning stories and all these things. Don't call conspiracy what they can call conspiracy because all that does is create fear and anxiety and dread inside of you. They're hanging on to these artificial lights. They're hanging on to these empty promises and it's producing a fruit that is so apparent, anxiety and fear and insecurity. And when darkness overcomes the artificial life, 
This is the result. And when we feel that happening, we do what we always do. We look for another voice, another talking head, another word that's going to offer us another promise or a new way of hope, a new way of thinking, a new thing to run after. And this is clear. Now what God does, he goes, listen, it matters whose voice you listen to. In chapter 8, verse 19, in 20, he says, they're going to come, Isaiah, because you're a man of God, and they're going to ask you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers who chirp. <laughs> That's a fa- funny phrase. They chirp and mutter. Should not a people inquire of the God? Should, should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living to the teaching and to the testimony? In other words, to the word of God, to what's true. If they will not speak according to this word, if they abandon the truth of God's word in his heart, it is because they have no dawn. The sun isn't rising. Darkness is overcoming Any voice but God's. Go to the mediums. Go to the psychics. Go to the tarot readers. Go to the necromancers. Call up the dead. Maybe they can tell us some things. Go to the culture commentators. Go to CNN, MSNBC, Fox, whatever it is. Look into the news anchors. Let's put our trust and hope in what our politicians are telling us. Maybe the celebrities and all the tweets and the philosophies and the ideologies of this age that are promising humanity progress if we do this and that and we'll finally achieve the utopia of our dreams. Whose voice do we go after? We are people who look for hope. And we put our faith and trust in what people say. Or we will put our hope and trust in what God says. And if we put our faith and our hope in the artificial lights, there is no dawn. In other words, the darkness will overcome. And eventually, when death hits our doorstep and we leave this earth and we didn't receive the light, There is truly no dawn. Verse 21, they will pass through the land. In other words, they will live this way, greatly distressed and hungry, anxious, exhausted, striving, wandering, disillusioned. They're hungry, meaning they'll never be satisfied. They'll always have to have more. Even if they achieved a little bit, it's never going to be enough. They have to get this. The grass will always be greener. I wish I could have this. All those types of things. Our souls and our hearts are never satisfied. And when they're hungry, when they are looking, when they don't have what they think they should have, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king. It's the authority's fault. It's the politician's fault. It's the leader's fault. It's those who in authority over me. It's their fault, their decisions, and their choices. That's why I am in my spot. That's why I don't have. It's all because of them. Oh, and if we even further that line of thought, we will do what our great ancestors have done, Adam and Eve, and we'll begin to also blame God. God, it's your fault. You put them in control. You put me underneath your authority. You made me this way. God, if you're good, then why this? God, if you're loving, then why this? And when they blame other people, and when they blame God, we and they still need help. If you're not going to listen to God's voice, where are you going to go? Verse 22. And they will look to the earth. We will go right back to the same cycle, the same doom loop, to try to find it again. They will look to the earth, but behold, the stress, the darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into deep darkness. Friends, I need to talk to you about the artificial lights of our time and our culture because we pursue them. And there are many voices that are offering hope and promises if we go after these things and we believe these things and our post-christian and borderline anti-christian society the artificial lights of our time the ones that we're putting our hope in collectively and individually seem to be wrapped up ever more so in this human progressive myth that if we just do enough and if we have the right conditions and influences in society and the economy humanity can finally arrive at this great and grand utopia 
We have bought into believing that if we can have better markets and better consumerism, greater science and technology, and if our politics were right, and even if there was some storm of like kind of full-on tolerance, like we will finally get to this place where this utopia can truly happen. And sure, we've made progress in some areas. Sure, we are now more affluent in this time than ever before. We are more technologically connected than ever before. Our scientific knowledge is greater than it was before, but yet we appear to be morally aggressing at an alarming rate. The past two years with the, the wave crashing after wave on our doorstep has really revealed the fruit of these artificial lights. It's really exposed the empty promises. We live now in a culture, even though all of these things seem to be happening, the result is clear. We have a culture, our youth, our younger generations have the highest levels of anxiety ever. Mental health illness is on the rise. There's falling IQ levels. There's an epidemic of loneliness, even though we're more socially connected through technology. There's an increase in addictions, and not just drugs. There's an increase in addictions through food, and obesity is on the rise. We're addicted to technology. Ever go to a restaurant and watch a husband and wife on a date? Do they actually talk, right? We have addictions to entertainment where Netflix even says, unashamedly, they want to steal your time. Addiction to sex and gambling and everything else. Friends, the, this has clearly been displayed. The fruit of these empty promises of our culture is being laid out in front of you. Maybe you felt it. Maybe you're in the midst of it. Whose voice will we trust? Whose voice will we go to? Are we blaming others? Are we blaming God? Because listen, listen, listen. If you don't listen to God's voice, you will go back to the ways of the earth and you will repeat the cycle ad nauseum. So let me ask you a straightforward question. Have you received the true light that God has promised? Do you live in this light? Are you weary this morning? Are there heavy burdens on your shoulders, a weight in your soul? Are you exhausted from striving and trying to attain and get anxious, frustrated? Are you lonely, disillusioned? I want you to hear God's heart. I want you to hear his voice speak words of promise that guarantee life, guarantee the promise of a better way. And that's where Isaiah 9 shows up. Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, a light has shone. Verse 6. For to us a child is born. For to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The people who have walked and live and dwell in a land of deep darkness, God has shown a light. Every Christmas declares that God has sent his son, Jesus. He's the light that shines in the darkness. He's the light that darkness cannot touch. It's all wrapped up in the name, Emmanuel, God with us. God has come for you, to rescue you, to save you from the darkness, from this cycle of doom that we find ourselves in, from being deceived and running after empty promises of trusting in artificial light. He's come. He's given his very self to dwell in you so that you could have life. And his name is Wonderful Counselor. Have you ever been to a counselor? And you walk out of that appointment and you go, why is he or she a counselor? Can I get my money back? Worst time ever. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. He's gentle. 
He's understanding. He's full of grace and truth. He doesn't break bruised reeds that are just hanging on. He doesn't snuff out a smoldering wick. He knows our frame. He knows we're longing for something. He understands all of that. He knows our wayward hearts. And as a wonderful counselor, he speaks timely truth. He will speak the truth right at your heart. But as he does it, he applies grace. That's a wonderful counselor. His name is Mighty God. The one who defeats our enemies. The one who defeats darkness. The one who takes away the sin of the world. Destroys the works of the devil. Defeats death. He's the one who holds us fast. That gives us peace and security. He's the one who won't let us go. He can't lose those he has received. The one whom the darkness cannot overcome. He is mighty God. He is the everlasting Father, the Alpha, the Omega, eternal, forever, unchanging. In the beginning was God. In the beginning was the Word. He's the source of everything. And that's why his light can never be overcome because he's not relying on an outside source. He is the true light. He is the life of all. He is the everlasting Father. He cannot change ever. You can trust him. His Word endures all time. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Do you feel anxiety and worry? Now, because we have this true light and we received and believed in Jesus, we get the very peace of God that guards our hearts and minds where we don't have to be deceived or pursue empty promises. We have this rest in knowing that whatever happens, whatever darkness comes, we can rest assured in Him because He's our peace. He's my shepherd. I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It will come, but I will not fear. I will not worry. I will be secure because my Prince of Peace has overcome. 730 years later after this promise, The Apostle John, a dear friend of Jesus, he starts his gospel message. John 1. In the beginning was the Word. Eternal. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He's the source of everything. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him. He spoke it into being. And without him, apart from him, nothing was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of humanity. The light shines in the darkness. It's continuing to shine in the darkness. And the darkness has not and will not and cannot overcome it. In him was life. You can only live a truly human life by receiving and believing in the light of God. In Jesus, he shines in the darkness. He will always shine in the darkness. Hell has thrown its very best at this light and still does to try to take it out. It can't. The cross crucifying Jesus didn't do it because light always wins. The light cannot be touched by the darkness. And John continues in verse 9. He's like, listen, this true light came into this world of artificial light. He came to his own, his own people, his own creation, and they didn't receive him. Hope in a baby. Hope in Jesus. Jesus is just an archetype. He's what we should aspire to be. Bible and Christianity actually gets in the way of this progressive ideal that we're going for. Why should we believe in that? It's old. It's dated. Many refuse to believe Jesus. Many. Even when he was born, his own town couldn't believe. We're like, Jesus, we know you. We know your mom and we're dad. We had you over for dinner. We saw you in diapers or a cloth. I don't know. They didn't have diapers. We know you. We saw you learn carpentry. I'm sitting in the chair you built. Jesus, we know you. How can you say you're God? Like, this is ridiculous. No, Jesus. 
To not receive him is to not listen to his voice, which means you're rejecting him, and the result is no dawn. If you don't receive his voice, you will look for it somewhere else, just like Isaiah said, to the earth. And when you look to the earth, you're looking for artificial light, and the darkness will overcome it. But to all those who did receive him, to those who believed in him, he gave the right to become sons and daughters, adopted new creation. And John would go through so many things portraying what happens inside of us in this gospel as a result of believing and receiving Jesus. The old life is gone. The new has come. We become free from the tyranny of our sin nature and the desires that want to lure us away into these empty promises. We are now free to love God without worrying how he sees us. Do I got to try to be better for God to love me? And now we're free to love other people without expecting to be loved back. That means we can forgive each other. We can give the benefit of doubt because we're free from it because our security is not in other people. It's It's in Jesus. He's the bread of life, which means we're fully satisfied and we will never hunger again. He's the living water, which means we will never thirst again. That means everything in our hearts and our souls are satisfied in Jesus. He's the light of the world. We will never walk in darkness. God lives in us. He abides in us. Emmanuel, which means we will now live a life of meaning and purpose and joy because God is going to be empowering us from the inside to live for him. And when you receive this light, you don't do it by like trying to be good and going to church and being baptized. No, you do it by faith. You receive it. In fact, I love what Jesus said to other people in John 6. He's like, what must we do to receive this bread, to get this promise of light? Like what must we do? It's human nature to strive and to attain. And Jesus said in John 6, 29, the work of God is this. Believe. Believe I loved you so much that I sent my only son into this dark world knowing that the son who created everything would be betrayed and hated and spat upon. Knowing that my son would be crucified. Just believe. Believe in him. I want to appeal to your heart right now. For those of you in this room who have never received or believed in the true light of Jesus Christ and you find yourself constantly pursuing artificial light, believing that you'll finally attain the false promise, I want you to seriously consider receiving him and believing in him. You don't have to get right before you can. He loves you. And quite frankly, some of you even think, like, if God knew me, if he knew my sin, if he knew my history, if he knew the situation I was in, there's no way I could ever come back to him. Don't believe that lie. While we were his enemies, while we were dead in our sin, he came. So what I want to do so I want to spend some time in just prayer. And if you're, like, you're that individual right now that wants to receive and believe in this true light that God has given us through his son, Jesus, I'm going to lead you in a time of prayer just to do that, to receive it by faith. And on the other hand, I know there's some of you in this room who have received this light previously. And maybe you've abandoned it. You've taken your eyes off of it. And you began again to long and trust the artificial light of this world? Because maybe God's taking too long? Or maybe you don't like God's plan? Maybe you don't like God's ways? And you say, I got to get after it myself. I want this. I need this. Then I will. I'm going to lead you in a time of prayer just to repent and return again to the light. So I just want to encourage you just to close your eyes and bow your head. Promise you we're not going to do anything that's going to make you uncomfortable. It's just a time between you and the Lord. God, I ask that in this moment you would be calling your children home. God, I ask that in this moment you would be revealing the empty promises 
of the artificial light that maybe they've been pursuing or they believe they need to have. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room right now who have never received this promise. Maybe they just put their trust in their religion, put their trust in maybe just the culture and all the things and humanity and put their trust in just trying to be good enough. Maybe they're at a place of despair and utter brokenness and hopelessness. And if that's you, all I want you to do is just pray with me in the quietness of your own heart. It doesn't matter the words. It just matters the posture of your heart. Jesus, I receive you. I believe you. That you came into this world to rescue me, to save me from the darkness. Help me, lead me, give me the strength to put my trust and my faith in you. Jesus, I gave I give you my life. And if you pray that prayer, I'm telling you right now, you've just moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the glorious light of the Son of whom He loves. Some of you who have abandoned the light. Just pray, appeal to his grace and his mercy and his kindness. Allow the wonderful counselor to speak truth, a timely word that will cut. Let him speak truth, but know it's out of his gentle and loving heart. Confess to sin and just simply say, Lord, I return. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Now before I wrap up, I feel compelled to speak to those who have received the light. I want to challenge you. I want you to think about something. And I want to do it in the form of a question. Which light does your life bear witness to? Which light does your life bear witness to? Because make no mistake, all of our lives bear witness to something or someone. Does your life bear witness to the artificial light or the true light? You see, in John chapter 1, it's a fascinating way that John writes it. You get this part of Jesus, and then there's another part where, where Jesus is showed up again. But right in the middle is this little interjection, and I believe John does it for a strategic reason, to help those who received the light, who believed in Jesus, to understand their identity and their purpose in this life. In verse 6, 7, and 8, it's just this odd, misplacing part of the text. It just shows up and says, and there was a man sent from God, and his name was John, John the Baptist, and he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He wasn't the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. And then just a few short verses later, the people come up to John, are like, John, who are you? Why are you doing these things? Are you the Christ? I'm not the Christ. Are you Elijah? I'm not Elijah. Are you a prophet? I'm not the prophet. Well, then who are you? I'm a voice. I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness in a land of deep darkness. Prepare the way for the Lord. And what I do as a result is I do this baptism to help people understand repentance. John right there made it clear that those who testify, who believe and receive the light, their purpose and their identity are wrapped up in being a witness. Who are you? You are a witness to the light because you've been saved. Now our great purpose is to tell people about Jesus, to bear witness to Jesus. And what does a witness do? A witness testifies. It tells people of what they've seen, heard, and experienced. It's not an argument. It's not a debate. It's not trying to say, well, this is all true. No, it's like, this is what I've seen and heard. This is what Jesus has done in my life. Let me testify to you of his goodness and his grace and his love and his mercy. Church, can I tell you in your life right now, there are people living in deep darkness that need you to bear witness to the light.
And so what I want you to do, and if this is a struggle for you, I want you to think about just a few things as we conclude. I want you to think about the only thing you really need to be an effective witness is to be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. Abide with Jesus. Talk with Jesus. Grow in a relationship with Jesus. Worship Jesus. When the church was moving, people were amazed at these group of fishermen, unschooled, uneducated people were doing this. And what they noticed was, oh, they were with Jesus. Has God ever been good to you? Raise a hand if God has been faithful to you. Has God been good to you? Have you seen God save you and rescue you from certain things? Have you seen God free you from sin? Have you seen God change other people? Testify to that. Bear witness to that. Be with Jesus. Reflect on his faithfulness in your past life, but also be with him so that you can start to sing new songs and tell new stories. Remember your journey. And like, let's just be honest, okay? I'm gonna, some of us don't really care that people are in darkness because we're so wrapped up in our own self. God knows that. But here's what I want you to do. Pray for them. Pray for them because you'll discover that your heart follows your prayers. So this week, here's the tangible thing I want you to do. On your way out, you're going to have these little glow sticks and an invitation card. I want you to think about your life, think about his goodness, think about his faithfulness, and testify to it, to someone. But think about the person that God would put on your heart who you would say is in darkness. And simply invite them to Christmas Eve. Here's why. Because on Christmas Eve, collectively, we as a church are going to testify to the light together. And God willing, many will be saved and moved from darkness to light. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time. I know there's a lot of words, there's a lot of things stirring and challenging in our hearts. God, I thank you for it. I thank you for this beautiful message of Christmas and this reminder that you didn't just come on Christmas. You were given to us on Christmas. You were just born. You were born to us. You didn't just live. You lived for us. And you didn't just die. You died for us. And you didn't just shine. You shined for us. Father, would you continue to stir in our faith to receive and to believe in you? And God, I ask for us as a church that we would be a church that bears witness to the life so that all would believe that you came into this world to save those that are lost, trapped in darkness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.